Anyway, so then I said, that's not a dragon, that's my wife! Uh, hello everybody, welcome to Busy Beards, a podcast about being online content creators and being busy and having beards. My name is TB Sky and I'm here with Patrick Scarizard Scarborough. You've gotten so much better at saying that over the last <laughs> few episodes. That's really the only improvement that we've had. Hello everyone, it's me, the name that he said, that's me. I am here. Uh, yeah, it's been a, a couple of weeks since the last one, since we've been, mm -hmm. as the name of the podcast implies, very busy yeah. with various yeah. things. Especially still you, better Patrick. Than you, you went to PAX and did stuff. Yeah, I did. I did. I was going to say, still better than six, week, six months, not six weeks. <laughs> six weeks would be still bad. Yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping not to enter a six-month winter, uh, a content freeze uh, ever again. But yeah, I did, uh, in fact, go to PAX. Um, how how much of your because I think we're mostly speaking to your people more more than my people our people I don't know maybe we have our some people children. yes um how many how many people uh, that follow you are, are European do would you if you had a guess looking at percentage? YouTube metrics it's only like twenty percent or something most of them are American okay all right well for the twenty percent of people and I'm sure there's still some more that don't know what PAX is it is the Penny Arcade Expo. Penny Arcade, uh, most people probably know what they are. They're, they're a, a, a long-time uh, comic publication, um, and the convention's been going on, uh, started in Seattle for a very long time. used to be just PAX, then it was called PAX Prime, now it's just called PAX West, because they've expanded to East and South and, and all sorts of other different areas around the world, because everyone's like, hey, we want a convention like that. And unlike... The other cons, like, you know, like a TwitchCon or a BlizzCon, which are more focused on, like, the company that runs them, uh, or even, like, uh, an E3, which is, like, games and, and media and stuff, PAX, I think, uh, despite the somewhat controversies around Penny Arcade, y'all can Google it, um, is, I think, always felt like it's for the people, you know, like, like you, there's hella vendors from different game stores around the world. There's tons of people bringing their different board games. There's, there's a very big tabletop group, uh, t tabletop, uh, gaming space compared to like any other convention I've ever been to. Uh, and it really just feels like, oh, hey, it's like, you know, it's like the circus is in town, the nerd circus. You just kind of go and, and you meet up with people and, and it, it's a very laid back, chill feeling and, and, uh, not as much of the floor is devoted to like hardcore, you know, like, uh, like multi billion dollar companies setting up at the floor. Like they have their spaces, but there's just as many devoted to indie games or community things as well, which I think, uh, is kind of the draw. So if any of you've ever wondered what the deal is with PAX, there it is. There's my, my breakdown of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a convention I've been wanting to go f to for a long time, but again, European, so <laughs> not not really an option. But it is generally a place where I get the sense that it's more about, you know, the the community aspect of things, which is not to say that there isn't a corporate aspect to it, but that the corporate aspect oh, yeah. is not dominant in the same way. Yeah, and I, and I actually, I'll start things off with a controversial opinion, and this is, I, I have to admit that this comes from a place of privilege, right? Um this is assuming that you're someone that has the ability to choose what packs you go to, right? I think in your case, you would because you'd be choosing to come from Europe anyways, you know, were this trip to ever happen in the future. But I know that there are tons of people who live local to one that, you know, they don't just get to, especially because ticket availability is nuts uh, a lot of the time. But I would say, drum roll, uh, if you had to go to one, I would actually say PAX East is my favorite. Um, I haven't yet visited Texas for South, but and the reasoning here is, um, PAX West is in uh, this Seattle Convention Center, and it's they're kind of in a conundrum where the convention center itself is incredibly difficult uh, to maneuver through. Like it's not; it clearly wasn't made to hold an event like this. Right. You know, there's tons of different floors with all sorts of different nooks and crannies. You can completely miss entire sections of people and shit that's there. You can, you know, it's harder to just go and be like, oh, I'll walk around the convention and we'll we'll find stuff. Right. Because you won't. And, and you might be one of those people who likes to go to cons for like artist alleys or like vendors and be like, where am I going to find those? And you you just won't. You won't know where to go. Right. Even uh, Riot. 
not to not to jump in this whole thing, but you know, Riot had a presence there, and it was it was very sweet. It was very everyone there, you know, despite the online outrage, everyone there was super supportive and loved it. Uh, but even they were like in some back ass corner that you couldn't really get to, and and I like had to direct people to get there uh, a bunch of times. So uh, it's just kind of a logistical clusterfuck where PAX East, uh, on the other hand, has less people. So you can kind of, there's an old man yells at cloud angle <laughs> of like, you know, of, of like, okay, there's, I mean, it's still a shitload of people, but it's less foot traffic. I think it's growing bigger, but the last few times I've been, um, you know, you can, you can move around. And it's like one giant room. Ninety percent of it is in in this giant, like ten times jumbo airport hangar style room, and all of the corporate stuff is at the front. As you move towards the back, you start hitting the indie stuff. Then you know. Then as you start moving for from there, you get to a lot of the vendors. And as you get to the very back, wide open tabletop cafeteria style seating. Uh, and and there are multiple sky bridges, and so if you ever need to know where something is, you literally just climb up to the bridge and look around. It's so much easier to get around. Where Pax West had like tons of maps that were completely different, right? Like stylistically, like it's like how the hell am I supposed to figure things out? So if you had a choice, I think Pax East is the one to go to. It it I think for a convention that is entirely about community, I think it's easier to feel. Like, the people there are grateful. They're like, wow, I, I sure I'm glad that we get a convention out here in Boston, which otherwise is, like, a cold Siberian nightmare. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've, I've heard, I don't know, steel, fish, a sports team. Like, I'm sure that they have other things in Boston, but... Uh, Pax Organized seems crime, to be like, I think? Oh, yeah, no, the, there you go. That's right. I've seen The, de- the Departed or <laughs> The Departed, depending on where you are. Um but yeah, so that's that's my rant about that. This is buckle up, everybody. This is mostly we got on call and Sky and was like, let's talk about packs, even though it's gonna be me mostly ranting. So this is a me ranting episode, probably. But before we dive into the whole thing, I wanna I wanna know what you've been up to because while I have stories and anecdotes to share, um, I don't want us to do like forty seven minute block of me yelling about stuff and then oh then what have you been up to oh you know this and that this and, this and whatever <laughs> I want to know what what's been while well, I've been gone for you know two and a half weeks or whatever what's what's up with you buddy I've I've had my head down uh, working on the absolutely stupidly massive video project uh, that I that I promised to my patrons on Patreon a, a mm-hmm. long while ago and finally. Uh, I just had to sit down and, and finish it. It's basically a breakdown of the League of Legends lore, um, like from from how it started, what happened to it, why did, why did it kind of fall apart a little bit, why did they have to retcon it? And I've I've spent some time talking to like people form people who worked at Riot formerly, and people in the know and stuff like that, trying to piece together exactly what happened. And that turned out to be like a forty five minute video that had to be fully edited as like a video essay style thing. And it was it was it was a really big fucking thing. And now it's out, and now I'm kind of done with it. And now I'm in in that sort of um, that post project phase where it's like I don't remember how to do or be anything else right now. Yeah, <laughs> like, and yeah, I have to yeah, get yeah. back That's... into 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 existing as a human being <laughs> on right. other no, terms. This was the Why League of Legends erases its own story video. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that, that was this one. Yeah, I saw. I I got to catch the beginning of it. A lot of people in my Discord were were watching it and discussing it. Oh shit! Talking nice. it over. Yeah, I know they they had very mean things to say about you. They didn't. <laughs> I I well, or maybe they did. I'm not really sure. Um, it's you know so much yelling and and screaming. It's hard to really understand. No, I I uh, I thought it was interesting from what I heard. I think. Um, Am I am I allowed to offer you on air criticism? Is that weird? No, is that's that, fine. Is this, it's completely is this fine. bad. Will you edit this out if, if it hurts your feelings? <laughs> I think I'll uh, edit in like the sound of fart noises if you say something so, I don't like. Well, well. So I had an inkling of something, and then I asked someone, and someone, who, a few people had already watched the video. I think broke it out. I uh, they they were saying that it made it. How can I how can I word this? They, they made it seem as if the way you presented yourself in the video was like you had a point or a conclusion, like like leading into it was almost like, hey, this is going somewhere. When the when it seems like the intent of the video was more to discuss the history of a decision and the things that end up happening, right? Like it sounds like 
the the content of the video is you are you are a third party and impartial viewer on the experience recounting the events but i think the the lead into it made it seem and and even you know perhaps the title of the video it, it makes it appear as though you're going to have like a big like hey this was an incredibly good thing for these reasons or this was a really bad thing for these reasons mm. rather than like a tour guide through what what went down maybe i'm uninformed as shit maybe that comes completely out of anywhere no i think that, i think that one's uh, that one's uh, pretty fair and it, it was partly like the title and stuff is it, like partly it's because i'm working on the goddamn youtube algorithm and i'm trying to figure out okay what's what's the thing that oh, yeah. gets people to click on the thing in the first place oh, so they'll make, even watch it and that's always make that money Basically. Yeah, that's, that's all I gotta say. That's yeah, always yeah. the shitty, shitty balance that you have to strike. Where like there, there is no version of being a YouTuber that doesn't involve some level of of clickbait, unfortunately. Absolutely. And that's just that them's them's just the breaks, unfortunately. And yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. a hard balance to 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 walk. And I'm sure I messed it up a little bit in the intro, especially since it was such a long project. A lot of it was made at different times. And so yeah, my approach no, to it I- changed a little bit over time. And and a lot of stuff got kind of because like there was a hell of a lot of stuff that I wanted to touch on in that video, especially early on. That kind of got thrown out the window um, halfway through the project. As I gave, as I, I guess more information uh, became available to me, I just had to change a lot, and that's that's what happens with long projects like that. And I should really have finished it faster, but I was waiting to hear back from people and stuff like that. And uh, it was oh, a yeah. whole thing. No, I, I I I only wanted to reflect that because I remember it being like a point of the conversation that was happening. For what it's worth, I, when I write shit, it's the same way. I'm like. Once I've made it to the end, I'm like, was this good? Yeah. Can, can anyone know? Like, it is like my brain is so desync from even being able to being able to point out like obvious grammatical errors that then someone reads it and <laughs> instantly I'm like, oh right, yeah, all that shit. So I <laughs> I absolutely relate to that thing. Yeah. So that's, you that's so that's you, where I was at the end of the project. It's like I have yeah. no idea if this is good. Like I j- I had no idea. Is this any good? You gotta is be anyone gonna it. watch it? I don't fucking know. I'm just gonna have to trust that after several years of making content I can at least make a competent video sort of without right. understanding what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> and that's something real quick, you know, because because we we claim uh, sometimes fairly that this podcast is about us as creators. Um, that is something I think people got to understand is like one of the most powerful skills that you can have as a creator is just stop working on the thing. Yeah. Right. Like, like, no, like in, in, it's funny, you know, like I'm, I'm not trying to like say it in such a goofy way, but it, it, it very much is. You have to know when to let it go. And if you're not, you know, ready, like, take your time or whatever, man, but but uh, it, it's never going to reach the level that I think you're thinking of uh, in your own mind. You just have to be, like, you know, setting out a plan, like, what is what are the topics that I'm supposed to cover, end it, and then if you really had enough left over, you didn't think you really did it, you just make another one. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that's that's the going. hard thing, is, is accepting the inevitability of failure. Because, like, every time you do a big project, something you really, really care about, there's a level to which you're going to fail at it. There's a level to which you're not going to live up to the beautiful, glorious vision in your mind of this fantastical thing and how good it's going to be. It's not ever ever gonna get there ever and you have to accept that and you have to go okay this is as good as i can make it right now without killing myself it has Mm -hmm. to go out into the world now and then for the next project i'll have learned some things and i'll do a little bit better but you you you, it's it's the kill your darlings thing except it's not so much kill your darlings as it is take a shotgun point it right in your darling's face watch them cry bitter tears (laughs) as the life escapes from their eyes and then you kill them co-sign this no fuck (laughs) all right i'm God, it it has ah. to be brutal. Like there is a brutality. Can we cut to a it. podcast at seventeen minutes or however long? <laughs> we can just end it now, right? That's cool. G- goodbye, everyone. I've become suddenly too busy for this. As the title, ha, ah, good jokes. Wubba lubba dub dub. No, uh, there is uh there is a saying at, at right. I think one of the better lessons that I learned there. Uh, and you hear it all around the industry. Uh, perfect is the enemy of good. Yeah. Uh, right. Like just. If if you can release a bunch of things, I mean, I think you're admittedly much better at this than I am, where it's like a thing comes out and you've trained yourself to be like, hey, I've turned on the camera and I talked about it and now it's there. It's out. You can read it. 
where I think, you know, my whole foray into YouTube has been very much like, okay, like, I want to, like, be strategic, I want to be precise, I want to, like, imagine the shape of the thing I want to bring into the world, and I'm not saying that you haven't done that thinking, I don't mean to disrespect you or anything, but I know, at least at this point, you're like, is a thing happening? Guess what, motherfucker, I'm talking about it. Like, yeah. like you, you remind me very much of, like, a beat reporter that's, like, rushing to the scene and is like... You know, if this is going to be where the conversation is, I got to get in here because my brand is like the conversation. Right. Yeah. It's 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 being able to add the take that the people here are interested in into that that whole thing. So so you did you did this video. You you, you put it out there. Seems like it's doing well. It's doing I, it, OK. It's, yeah. You know, it's 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 no, you know, yelling at someone on Tumblr blowing <laughs> up material, you know, but 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 whatever is, you know, what? <laughs> who yeah. Could we, oh, God. Who could, that whom's, video. Whomst among us can never expect to be as popular as like the one random thing that went viral. Um, but uh, other than that, what what's anything else? Anything going on? Uh, not especially. I'm, I'm just trying to get back into making things that aren't you know and a uh, hyper edited project i've been talking to a dude who maybe i want to hire as an editor on occasion just to take some mm-hmm. of that workload off of me but you know it's uh, I'm, I'm still in a headspace where i'm like i've been floating on this cloud for so long and now i've i've fallen back down to earth but i haven't really quite adjusted to gravity quite yet but uh, you were at pax as a content creator for odyssey right yeah, not Odyssey, uh, Omen. But. Not Odyssey. Omen, yes. Uh, well, so it's weird. I, I'm sponsored by Omen. Any one of you who's uh, listening to this uh, using any sort of Alienware headset legally has to stop. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. They yeah, do. It's, it's it's like it was a whole contract, and I think they have like snipers outside his house that'll kill yeah, him yeah, yeah, if yeah. he That's doesn't. That's the so. thing at all times. No, I do have a whole stack of Omen stuff. I wear the headset because I'm legally supposed to on stream. Uh, I have the rest of the stuff that isn't set up yet, but it's all very high quality. I have a laptop from them. It's the best laptop I've ever had. Like, I'm not shilling. It's 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 very good. Um, they, they've treated us all pretty well. It's pretty cool. Uh, but no, I actually went to this. I didn't think that I was going to, and there was a tweet. Uh, I hope no one is upset with me about this. There was a tweet from a Twitch partner manager that was like, hey, Twitch partners, if you wanted to go to uh twitch or, or if you want to go to if you want to go to pax and you didn't have a ticket message me and i just dm'd him and like 10 seconds later like immediately it was like okay give me this info and i gave it to him and he's like cool go pick it up at will call and i was like that was like a month out from pax and i was like what the fuck i could just like it was and so immediately my plans changed right and and i was added to all sorts of media lists and and it was very surreal uh to be emailed by all these different groups uh, i did get to see a few games that was really cool um, I did go to Riot's uh, streaming truck, which was a whole <laughs> – it was something. Uh, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll get into that one. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, but, but really, yeah, it was interesting because this is the first time that I've been to an event. Um, well, I say the first time. Um, I, I technically did this for PAX East as well, but I think it was just a little different. But this, but this is the first or second time I've been to an event just for me. Like, I'm not – I'm not associated with anyone. I don't have any other job to do that isn't my own. Uh, and so, a- as you all know, by the way, maybe if Skyen wills it, we'll put it on the screen. I have a I have a YouTube series called Friendetta. It's a Magic the Gathering uh, Commander YouTube series. Uh, it's really even fun. If, it really you. is. I really enjoy that. it. I believe him now. <laughs> I there there may there may have been a time I would have called. It, I'm joking. I would have never done that. Um. No, but it's 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 a let's play series between friends, uh, and and it's very very fun, and I really I really do want people to check it out because I think uh, we I try to do a good job because a lot of my community hasn't been into Magic or doesn't really know a lot about it. It's hard to be in the gaming space and not know anything about Magic, right? Because the art is so prolific, like you just you know you, you like trip and fall into seeing Magic cards pretty much everywhere around you. Uh, but a lot of people don't know how to play, and, you know, I didn't want to be like, hey, well, now I'm making YouTube series based entirely on stuff that you don't know about, so I would say it's pretty new player friendly, as new player friendly as we can make something like this. Uh, we we very heavily focus on the interpersonal politics and deal making uh, and the intensity that comes along with that, so it should feel like you're watching friends drink and play like Pokemon Stadium or like Mario Party, right? Like, even if maybe you don't know the specifics of what's going on, you can figure out through, you know, 
yelling and screaming and tones of voice who's on top and what's happening and and giggling and stuff and we just released the fifth episode and i think it's super funny both my editor cameron and i doing reviews uh he we we like laughed multiple times at parts we had heard like like 10 times already that's how it's good yeah and i will and i felt i was like am i am i drinking my own kool-aid hella hard right now or is it actually (laughs) just super funny so so that's it y'all can go check it out but i brought uh i i have now i have like 12 or 13 commander decks and so command you know it's the 100 card singleton decks it's the format that i play and it's multiplayer which is why i play it because you, you get to meet more people and i'm a very people driven person and so every night at PAX, you know, I was invited to, like, go to a Twitch party and go to a, an Omen party. Sorry, Omen. Uh, and, like, go to all these other parties. And I just kind of ditched all of them and went to this place called Mox Boarding. If any of you are in Seattle or the Bellevue area, they have two in Seattle and Bellevue. And it's – it's uh, you've heard of places like Battle and Brew, right? I know you're familiar with, yeah. with Lubu. Uh, I would actually say and, – and not to shade on uh, Brian uh, Lubu himself – uh, I, I like this place a little better than Battle and Brew. I think Battle and Brew is a more like lounge with your friends and check out consoles. This had a very organic tabletop feeling. Um, it, it is both like a an, it is it's a storefront first for board games and, and games and, and comics and stuff, and then has a restaurant attached to it that is also very it's a very sit down restaurant so, so the tables are huge you can you can like check out a board game and sit there for hours with your friends over dinner and drinks playing it um and so every night i was just there and i brought my decks uh, a bunch that i brought to teach people with that were a little more straightforward some of my more personal ones are a little higher powered and i just made it a point to all, every day at the con when i wasn't at meetings when i wasn't working or every night just go sit amongst the people and play card games with them. And, and we had a lot of really sweet matches. And I kind of thought to myself, you know, hey, this maybe isn't the most effective way to do stuff. But I figure, you know, my entire career at this point has been very, I guess, you know, word of mouth, very community driven, community focused. What better way to, you know, have have some games with people and be like, hey, by the way, I make I make videos if you want to hang out, if you want to stop by, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, so that was a lot of fun. I, I really felt good about that. Because uh, I think we'll get into it one day, but the whole like corporate versus personal brand, whatever, has been like a very long like thing for me as a human. Um, but PAX itself, uh, I I got to play a few games. Um, I got to play uh, the Resident Evil Two remake. I got to play uh, Mega Man 11, which excited me a lot. I'm a lifelong Mega Man uh, fan. Very, nice. very big fan of that series. And I played Devil May Cry 5. Ooh. Um, and, uh, and then I also got to play a game called Boyfriend Dungeon. Um, and Is that Boyfriend Dungeon it sounds? <laughs> it's amazing. It's so good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rant on these. Uh, and I think those are the other ones I played. No, I also played one called Mad Machines that is uh, being developed... Uh, by one of my old managers at Riot, who's moved on, uh, and it, it's it's like a it's like a hockey, it's like Rocket League, but if you, instead you were playing hockey with robots, uh, and so you skate around and fight on the rink and you break people's armor off and stuff. It had promise. It definitely wasn't super there, but it was also very early in the thing. So uh, if anyone is like, "Hey, I like Rocket League, but wanted it to be more about robot fighting instead of cars," you can go check out Mad Machines. Um, but yeah, Boyfriend Dungeon, and I don't know, hopefully, I don't know if it's against your thing. Hopefully, we can include links, because I think yeah, yeah. I think some no of your problem. community, certainly mine, would, would love this one. So, it, it is a similar vibe to Dream Daddy. I hope that they do not loathe the comparison. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it takes place in a modern setting. You're, like, hanging out in an L.A. slash Bay Area style city, and it's a, it's a dating sim slash dungeon crawler. Uh, and the, and the the core conceit of the game is that there are people, very attractive single people, who transform into weapons. And I'm not really sure if they're weapons first that turn into people or vice versa, but they are shapeshifters. There's maybe there's a curse going on that they were very hush on the sort of details there. Uh, but but I had a, a gentleman named Sunder who turned into a scimitar, uh, and then I forget the name of the woman, but she turned into a dagger. 
and those are my two dateable weapons. Um, and I kind of approach this being like, hey, this is a novel idea, right? Like date your weapons. Like that's a cute, fun thing for, for, uh, for I think this, this sort of non serious, uh, and yet, uh, still, uh, very deep, uh, game genre that I think Dream Daddy kind of helped open up, right? That's like, hey, let's not, not everything has to be guns and shooting, but also not everything is like vapid and like brainless either, right? Yeah. Um, and so as I was playing through it, uh, it's like your health is boba, which I love. I'm, I literally have <laughs> bubble tea on my desk that I'm drinking right now before stream. Um, and, and, uh, when you die, uh, the first, the only dungeon that was available, and they're procedurally generated, so anybody who loves that procedurally generated isometric hack and slash, it's all there. The controls are really tight. The way that damage was done and the movesets between the two weapons that were available were actually really good. I think the game is releasing with eight and they can go up to ten based on how much their stuff gets kickstarted. There is rumors of like a, a hammer woman. Uh, that is going to be added next if people back it. So, so, so please go do that <laughs> for reasons for yeah, science. Because we uh, want the Hammer Woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do. I very much do want the Hammer Woman. And you can date all of them. You don't have to like do multiple playthroughs. They're cool with it. They're they're weapon people. Um, but I uh, the the two weapons that I had it felt like they had different move sets. It felt very responsive. It was very similar to Hyper Light Drifter. In, in controls and in ways, you know, you had, you had ranged attacks and you had your, your melee stuff, but then there were areas in the mall. Did I mention it was a mall? We were in a mall. We were in an, an abandoned mall and that's what we were diving through. And there are like areas where, you know, uh, they have those, maybe this is just an American thing. Maybe it's not. Um, areas where they're like massage chairs. Right, and and you're supposed to like put in coins for them. That's like a very American thing. It's I certainly think. not a yeah. European thing. I can tell you that. Well, they're just wide open areas where like nothing is happening in the mall, and then these kiosks form that are like here's some massage chairs, and kids like to sit on them and stuff, and uh, or like a fountain, and you can choose to level up uh, one of your weapons at this location by like relaxing with them, and you get a cute scene where they come out of their weapon form, and they like you have a little emotional moment, you know, your XP goes up, and so when you're done, either you're defeated or you finish, you go as far in the dungeon as you can go, you get uh, XP that basically works you towards a date, and then when you go on the date, uh, depending on how you do in the date, at the end, you then progress their battle XP, and and they have a talent tree, so there's kind of this, they feed into one another. The so sort basically, of like, they, they pluck the dating mechanic directly into the combat loop. Yeah, which which that I like really a lot, cool. right? Yeah, so so it's like as you as you are unlocking someone's abilities, you're also getting to know them better, which would make sense. The more you trust and the more intimate you are with someone, the better in combat you're going to do. Uh, and and there's like your mom texts you a lot, and it's very cute. Like all of the little bells and whistles and things about this game uh, that I thought uh, were most impressive to me were like aside from the main mechanics like all i had to do was play the game for just a little bit to be like oh cool the dating part is good and the and the hack and slash part is good where i think most people would be like oh maybe it's gonna be good at one not the other but then uh the style the way that it was done meeting the developers the team they were all super happy to have people there over in the indie mega booth uh so yeah boyfriend dungeon absolutely check that one out i'm like looking at audacity to see how long i've been talking because i want to make sure we have time to get to everything uh <laughs> super quickly talking about the capcom stuff resident evil 2 was okay uh if you've liked if you liked resident evil 2 before you're probably gonna like it now Is it, um, still it was controls yeah uh a little better it's also uh puzzlingly it's the resident evil 4 third person view oh yeah, it's that's not it's obviously not the uh the 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 fixed camera that that the old old games had but i thought it was interesting because i played re7 on stream and i loved it and my community loved it and i really loved the first person view and i and i it's like on one hand those games were never made to be at the first person view and so therefore going to third person camera seems like it's probably a natural fit um you know, like, like it doesn't feel like it's changed too much. That said, I think the games are by far creepier when you do the first person because I think they nail how to do ambiance so well in yeah. the modern versions. And this was no exception. The uh, the visuals were very stunning. Uh, so 
you know, and, and like, I remember my older brother playing this game on the N64. So like, that's how long it, it really has been. <laughs> and so the graphics update is, is super cool. Um, you know, but there's also a little bit of like suspending your belief where like the demo began and I'm like, you know, in the police department, there's like a dying cop who's helping me get through places and I have to like find four concrete slabs to plug into an angel statue. And I'm like, Okay, this feels a little goofier like 17 years later or whenever, right? That you're like yeah. in an intensely, you know, like it's one thing when you're in like an old mansion, right? And it's a different thing when you're like urban outbreak. How are we going to escape the zombie apocalypse? With the Go four through ancient artifacts of concrete. Right, yeah, you know, it's like, yes, of course all these cops believed in witches or whatever the fuck that let them do this. But one thing, and, and they seem to soft confirm it, I think they were, you know, uh, uh, the PR people who were helping me through the booth. Uh, shout outs to Capcom as well, by the way, specifically Hannah Wu. It's a friend of mine who hooked me up with this whole thing. I didn't have to wait in line. I got scumbag VIP treatment. They just took <laughs> me around. They gave me a T-shirt. That's cool. Uh, which, you know, normally you kind of get T-shirts. You're like, oh, great. I'll throw this away. But it's a, it's a good shirt. I like it. Um, it's got blood splatter on it like I've been eaten by a zombie fingerprints and stuff um but yeah so they soft confirmed that every zombie is its own model um which is weird because you because you i don't know it's like a not a thing i thought of but when i thought of it it seems like a no-brainer for a triple a game like this right because this isn't an open world like the new spider-man perhaps where there's got to be some level of procedural generation yeah. Uh, on, when it comes to the New Yorkers, right? But it's also not the older games where you just probably have like three to five different sprites for it and you just kind of rotate between them, you know, like little palace. Um, like if you think about these games, you can probably pinpoint the amount of exact zombies that you will need in the entire game. It's probably somewhere between 100 and 200 in reality. Um, and so of the like 10 that I saw, they were uniquely detailed. You could see specifically like how they had died or like where parts of them were falling off. Uh, it was cool to see. Uh, it was actually, and it added a lot to the variety and, you know, before SJW's diversity, blah, blah, blah. it was like the first person who attacked me was an elderly man, um, who, who had kind of secretly, I died to him in the first run and then I respawned and, and did it again because he breaks into a window far behind you. And if you don't see it, uh, you can get closed in. And then there, there's like a white woman and an Asian dude. And then like, and then like a, 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 a black police officer. And it was just one of those things where very subtly I was like, I didn't even clock that it was like, wow, oh boy, diverse, you know, whatever. And that's not even the point of what I'm trying to say here, but more that it was like each of these felt like an individual named character or like a named NPC that you could attribute actual things to. And it was it was yeah. what impressed me the most in the demo, actually, yeah. was just like, wow, I would absolutely love to play a game where I can see the zombie hordes and not see like a repeated model and, and imagine the lives of the people who who had attempted to escape so yeah I mean, that was and, super cool. and for a zombie fiction that it, it, as an artistic choice it makes a lot of sense that you would want the zombies that are coming after the main character to be reflective of something like a real urban environment because like that's 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 the horror that's the that's the terror is that all these people who once were whole full people with like personalities and dreams and hopes are turned into this you know mindless horde of just flesh eaters coming after you like this this that's part of the horror of the zombie fantasy it also it makes a lot of sense to me to do the thing where you really put a lot of work into each individual zombie if you have the option to yeah and so i, I think at the end of the day uh, anyone out there who likes the resident evil franchise is going to be happy that the game exists um it's it's fine. Like, again, I think it's going to be super well made. I can't say I'm even necessarily going to stream it. It's it's hard for me to get super excited by remakes these days. Like, I think they have to really go above and beyond to get me. And I think that's a me thing and not necessarily a them thing. Uh, we were talking, the lady who was there with me, uh, I forget her name, but she was very nice. Um, I think it started with a C. She she was working for, I think, uh, US Gamer, Us Gamer. I'm not really sure how to say it. Uh, it's one of those two. Uh, and we were kind of talking, waiting in line, like, uh, or wait, waiting for the setups to to be available. How it's like Capcom almost more than Nintendo or more than any other thing, like so rarely come out with new IPs, yeah. but instead like obscenely support the ones that they have. Like, will skyrocket them, right? Like, think about how many Monster Hunters 
uh, came out in like the last year, mm. right? You know, like Generations, Generations Ultimate, World, whatever. Someone is going to be like, Patrick, you're wrong, and I understand. But I'm just, they, they seem very dead set on continuing their dynasty to the point of remaking the classics in when staggering fidelity yeah. uh, where where Nintendo has such a wide catalog it's like you know it's like a thing that people are like excited about the new Crystal Chronicles remake or like or like begging for remakes of older games where with Capcom you just like know it's going to happen yeah. right it's like yeah you just wait it'll be there the the nth anniversary of a thing is going to come with the most pimped out stuff um but yeah, I played Devil May Cry 5. Uh, next is what I want to talk about. Nero was the available character. They, uh, The lady said that there were three playable characters and that Ooh. Dante was one of them. And so everyone who... Oh, Virgin is, like, is the last one. I know yeah. because I saw there was the splash art thing they did. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, I, I don't know if it was confirmed. I actually don't know that it was hard confirmed at the time that I was there. But uh, the one of the women I was staying with was like, is like a the biggest Virgil fangirl of all time and was like, <laughs> if you see Virgil, you have to fucking tell me. <laughs> um and so I think I think they were trying to like wink at it because I think the people at the event don't didn't know if it was confirmed or not. But yeah, it's it's if anyone's worried about Virgil not coming back, Virgil is almost certainly coming back. So, yeah. so you'll be happy. Uh in in six months the game comes out, it's a completely different OC and Virgil's just a generic bad guy. Come <laughs> back to this video and tag me. But um I will apologize to you. Uh, but it was cool. Uh, there was uh, so I, I have to say as well. I played through Bayonetta when I was a younger babby gamer, and I did very poorly at it. And I think you know a lot of these games are designed to like you get average scores, like or, or like bad scores, like lower than average scores more often than not. Yeah, because they go really hard on being like, hey, like learn the systems of this game, weave your beautiful combos. And this game felt, at least in the demo, a lot more accessible to me. Like, I played a DMC, the, like, reboot, and I liked it quite a lot. I'm I'm a criminal in that respect. Uh, but they had a similar thing where it was easier for me to get into, and then when I did super awesome combos, I felt rewarded. Yeah. But I didn't feel like I was being punished for playing the game at a basic level. Uh, the game begins, and Nero just has your basic sword slashes with very little variation, and your guns that sort of extend the combo. But he has a giant robot arm, and the robot arm, uh, named puzzlingly Devil Trigger, which is weird because Devil Trigger is a mechanic in the previous games. You go Super Saiyan, so... Uh, they, I guess, renamed it here, uh, is is sort of this thing where you swap between different oddly European-named arm cannons, as Japan loves to do. Uh, <laughs> it's just like pick out random European lore that has nothing to do with this the This is the arm thing. cannon Idleweiss, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I actually... Wait, I, I think that might have been one of them. Like, I'm not joking. <laughs> like, 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 I'm not like you said that and my eyes got super wide. But it's, it's, uh, and then one of them is like, Gehane, Gehane, or Gehanus or something. And I'm like, who knows what the fuck that means? I don't know what you're on about. Um, but, uh, so the, the, the talking about the mechanic, the, the arm cannons have a basic function. They're sort of like your heavy attack. Yeah. Uh, but, but they, but they, they, Go into sort of in-fight cinematics, too, which is cool. Uh, you charge them, and and the charge goes... It's very long. It's a very long charge if you hold them down, but then you're rewarded with a huge payoff. One of them turned my arm into a laser cannon where each hit of the laser was a combo, and so you could, like, juggle entire groups of enemies in this cannon, uh, which was nuts. And then you can, you can explode them in the bodies of your enemies as well when you're done, like when they're about to be discarded. So the idea is that you use the different, you know, the light devil trigger, the, the charged devil trigger and the explosion to swap to the next one, the hot swap as combo extenders as well. Um, and one of them was like an uppercut that then you would like ride the person's body up like a surfboard. Like it's, <laughs> it's like hard to explain. No one that I have told this gets it, but it's fucking sweet. Like it's like, it's, it's super cool. And so I actually ended up beating the demo faster than anyone had done at the event. Uh, partially I like to think because I am an alpha gamer and God's gift to competitive uh, and and personal games alike, uh, but also uh, I think I exploited a bug that I found. Uh, so I was fighting the last uh, or the the first boss at the end of the demo, um, and I forget what its name was. It was like Colossus or Legion. It was a 
it was a it was a biblical esque name for a thing. Goliath, I think it was Goliath. Yeah. Um, and it's huge, and Nero's funny, and the banter between them is good. Uh, but it's one of those bosses that's like you know fifteen times your model size or whatever, right? Like you got to jump around on this boss. And the thing that happened was when I would use the uppercut that is usually your launcher. It didn't appear to have a cooldown, and so maybe this is just how the game is, and I just played it optimally, but it certainly felt like a bug, where I basically uppercut, so going from like the ground to the mid-torso of this enemy, slash a bunch, then just uppercut again, and now I'm like at its shoulders, and then slash a bunch, and then wait a little bit to fall, and then at the torso, uppercut again... And just keep doing. So I was like constantly in the air doing the same like five moves, but in a in just enough of a rotation that I managed to get like a double S rank on the boss itself. And you know there'd be like a cutscene. We'd fall through the ground. I'd restart the combo. I was just dodging every single ability because it can't hit me because I'm floating around it in this like broken ass way. So I, it felt like I cheesed it, but they gave me like a special pin and I gave it to someone because pins are weird at packs and they'll like froth <laughs> at the mouth if you have a rare one. Um, the one that really excited me the most is Mega Man 11, uh, which is the, uh, fans of the Mega Man series uh, will know Capcom had sort of a break uh, with Mega Man. And I asked the people who were there, they had one of the producers there who's being very skilled in PR, talk to me about it. And, and what I appear to get, what, what I seem to understand from the woman who was uh, the reporter woman who's there with me was uh i think his name's keiji ionuma something like that someone please correct me if no, someone no, that's, knows that is the name of the game designer or or, or is was it inafune or, or did i did i get it right ionuma am i accidentally smart maybe it's one of those two but you you said i got it right the first time so i I'll think so you. yeah and and we'll blame you if, if i get it wrong now uh but uh yeah he left and basically they were like cool we're never gonna make another Mega Man game because he went to go do mighty number no. nine and I one day I want to go back and I want to like dissect what the hell actually happened. But people now, you know, history has decided Mighty Number no. Nine it it flopped. It it absolutely did not meet expectations. And this I think emboldened uh, Capcom to say, "Cool, let's get back in the saddle and let's care about Mega Man again as a property because we have the momentum." Because the Kickstarter, if anything else, showed how much people wanted the old style Mega Man. Yeah. games again um and, and it was very exciting it has a new mechanic called the 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 double gear system or whatever and these are basically shoulder buttons that share a resource um and if you press one of the shoulder buttons uh it'll tick down it's like a mana bar like an energy bar probably uh and it makes all of your robot master abilities uh like ex fire like yeah. they have like a special powerful move so for instance like charging uh, I had, them up in Mega Man x kind of yeah, kind of. And and so, uh, for instance, I had a, a uh, boulder man was one of the enemies and I had the ability to uh, create like a uh, five, just just five indistinct or uh, like, God, sorry, let me take this again. Uh, boulder man was an enemy uh, and uh, his ability when I got it was to create almost like a curtain of bricks, like like five bricks in a line and then they would just fall. Mm -hmm. So it's just like an overhead sort of ability. And when you had the, the like power gear activated, it created like 40 of them. It was like a Tetris, you know, like a just absolutely rain down on someone. You, you'd maybe get two of those off and then it would take a long time to regenerate. The other one, which was unintuitive to me at first, but seems like the game is balanced around it, slows time, but you stay a little bit faster. So there's a lot of platforming things that are really, really difficult to pull off that, you know, a savvy or a super experienced player would probably be able to get through, but you can just activate this thing, and it doesn't feel like cheating. Like, I think that was that seemed to be the energy on the floor as people maybe thought it was, but it's actually super cool to pull it off in the moment. Uh, I played on a stage that I loved a lot. I loved the design of the new Masters. They both look like the old art, but also seem cool. My favorite thing about the Robot Masters in uh, Mega Man was that the original six, uh, oh, can I name them? Uh, Fireman, Electman, Bombman, Gutsman, Cutman, and oh, who's the last one? Because there are only six. Isn't oh, it's just Fireman. Dude? No, uh, did I say Fireman at the beginning? Yeah. If I did, yeah, then, then it's Iceman. Iceman is the last one. 
Um, they were each originally designed in the lore to help uh, cultivate. Uh, uh, they were building a city. They're city builders, and they yeah. and they each each one of them talks about like some part of the city's creation, and then they went haywire. And so it's this idea that the robot masters were created for these purposes, sort of not related to combat and then upon you know either being manipulated or recognizing their own you know sort of rights or whatever the the plot of the day is um this would happen right and people would be like okay cool uh now they have different powers blast man uh, stage was super cute because as a stage it's uh blast man is there for special effects and so the whole thing is a movie set Oh, cool. Um, and so it's like all different fireworks and explosions going off that are all like pyrotechnics and stuff. And the, the like gimmick of the stage are you're standing on a bunch of crates that will explode, but in like in a domino style order. So there are many different rooms that you're in where you have to like pause and wait for the, the explosions overhead of you to go to like free something while also running from the explosions yourself on the bottom floor. Uh, and enemies will explode when, when they die. So you have to be, a, careful about where you do it and it was just super fun it felt very similar to when i played sonic mania recently that you're like cool fresh takes on an old thing so um yeah so, so mechanically novel visually consistent it, it felt like more of the thing that i loved growing up as well as uh but, but not just cashing in on it which is weird <laughs> to say in the modern era yeah uh, especially coming from like a giant like capcom yeah, I mean, I, I I certainly I've been watching gameplay footage of Mega Man Eleven. I've been really interested in how it recreates because, like, they did Mega Man Nine, I think it was, where yeah. they completely just went with the old sprite style. They literally just made an NES game, basically, with a few extra yeah. bells and whistles. And now they're trying to sort of okay, so what the hell does this look like if we actually try to do it with modern tech? Which I'm very, uh, from an aesthetic perspective, I'm very interested in, in in doing a little breakdown of that once it finally comes out. Oh yeah, and and actually, uh, I I think now that you mentioned that, yeah, their style it is it is the sometimes maligned, sometimes exalted two point five D, and uh, and I actually didn't notice for the first like half of the level that I was playing because I think they've probably done it the best of uh, of any games that I've seen. Like it it wasn't distracting. You're not like looking in the background and seeing how different it is from things in the foreground. Uh, the the hitboxes of the characters felt like the same like 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 what you would expect right because yeah if if you're if you've played Mega Man games of old you know that like you can jump and he does his weird like lift one leg up and lift his arms up but you're but you're really in the air and you don't get clipped by things um it also came with a casual mode uh that I liked a lot uh it, I I'm a I I don't want to spin off on this uh too hard but I'm sure you have opinions I'd love to hear them about difficulty <laughs> in games and difficulty options like I hate when I hate when your first difficulty is like baby and yeah, and the your, Wolfenstein and your, thing where it's like oh yeah you want to be a little baby and play the game oh yeah poor you and then there's some gamer out there who's like I have arthritis in both hands I can't do this shit this fast yeah and they feel so, really fucking condescended too yeah exactly well and so what I liked about it was um the game still appears to be quite hard on the like on the easier mode. Um, but there's also it, it, they had a they had a literal beginner mode, which is the same as easy. And easy is basically just uh, you you deal or you take a little less damage from mm. attacks, so it's just less punishing to go through the you know, the platforming is still hard. It's it's very tight. And it's still there. Um, but on the ca on the not not casual, but the the beginner mode, the like this is your first Mega Man ever mode, the like below easy. It's the same as easy, except they take out all one hit kills. So. Uh -huh. uh, so stepping on spikes does not immediately end your life, right? And and many people know you get, like, one energy tank refill per stage, uh, and you get, like, three lives, and then it's over, and, like, that's what you have to try to beat and learn the level. Um, but also, like, falling down a pit will still heavily hurt you, but it'll it'll put you, you know, the little bird will come out, it'll put you right on top, which I am such a huge fan of those things. I loved it when they did it in Fire Emblem. The like, here's your hardcore. Everyone has permadeath, and versus here's no permadeath. They just lose a bunch of XP and stuff. Like uh, more options, more ways for people to play. We're older now. <laughs> like, like no one. I shouldn't say no one, but most people who are playing games at 14 are not as good at them reflexively at 
they are at 24, same as 34. Like, we go in and out of things. Our bodies change. Like, let's be an industry that celebrates and, and respects that stuff and yeah. doesn't demean people. So the fact that you can just play still a challenging and awesome game and just not get killed because a pixel on a block shoved you too close to a pixel on another block, uh, I applaud that decision. I played on normal, and they were like, are you sure? Because, like, for a press thing, because, like, had I not played on normal, I probably would have beaten two stages. Um, but playing on a normal i just wanted to see how it felt true to form and there was certainly some brutal sections and and i i, I was also playing on an xbox controller so boo uh i guess i've I literally couldn't even identify the xbox one controller when i saw it <laughs> it was so foreign to me uh sorry xbox users but uh yeah i don't know it, it felt cool it felt like a game that I would pleasantly, happily stream, and when I died, I would I would get better at uh, the designs. Of the enemies all felt super cool. So was was generally a very big fan of that. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I do like, especially with a game like Mega Man, that they put some accessibility options in there because, like, I've played the original NES Mega Man games. Like, I my my first Mega Man games were the uh, SNES Mega Man X games, and then I went back and played the original Mega Man games, and it was like, yeah, I I could break some controllers over this. Where it's like, it's satisfying to figure it out, but like, it, it's really nice that there is an option for people who like, don't want to play an arcade fucking difficulty <laughs> and who aren't really ready for that kind of frustration. Right. And well, and it's kind of a controversial thing because I think anyone who's even been trying to make an old school game is like, I'm not really sure, like, like they try to to do Nintendo hard is what I've heard people call it, but but uh, like Ducktales Remastered was like the biggest heap of bullshit I've played in a long time because uh, the original Ducktales is like a game you could beat in like half an hour. Yeah, um, like it, it was it was an incredibly short game. Um, and there's a difference to me, like like it was clear that they were informed by what they thought Nintendo hard was, but the degree to like how excruciating they went to make the game go like actually went beyond it there there's there's a conversation we could or should have sometime that's about like people inspired by old things overshooting the old thing because of their inability to gauge it you yeah. know um it, it, and so you see this with art styles a lot where like you know i think we're coming out of maybe maybe we're still in it but we're coming out of almost like retro saturation mm. where as an industry people were like cool everyone loves old stuff let's make stuff that looks like old stuff right and it's like you still have the gems like shovel knight that clearly understand like where to borrow and where to be original right like what actually made those original art styles so appealing in the first place such that feeling like you're playing a super nintendo game can be awesome and not limiting um versus ones where you're like hey this is rote and i've done this before like you're at this point you're just retreading it's not inspirational you're not you're not yeah. aspiring to be anything so i don't know it's weird apparently the creator's of DuckTales Remastered, that team, like, worked on the Shantae series, which is Yeah, it's way beloved. forward. They've done tons and tons of retro-style games. Yeah, I I just think <laughs> DuckTales Remastered is a steaming pile of shit. I hated it. Uh, <laughs> someone, at least... Well, maybe not, because your, your community is nice, but someone's going to be like, I didn't have trouble beating it at all. And I'm like, fuck off. They did a thing... Sorry, I have to... I'm getting myself heated about it. <laughs> they did a fucking thing. It's the biggest bullshit of all time. So the final level, after you've beaten the four main levels, and, and again... Every level, it's it's you get two lives, and then somewhere in the stage is hidden a third. But it's usually very perilous to get there, and, and it's it's hard to say whether or not you should. Uh, there are no checkpoints, so dying will send you all the way back to the very beginning of the level um, per life. So so that's that's what you have uh, going on. And so the final level is clearly one of those like okay, let's through every single mechanical challenge that we can have, littered with tons of instant KOs, and the hitboxes are not very good. So you're just like cool, I'm gonna die to rocks or whatever. You make it to the final boss, you beat the boss, right? Then. Yeah. There is a boss beyond that, like a super boss, and you're like, okay, cool, this feels like the end of the game. Then beyond that, there is a a you racing against the enemies to escape the active volcano hardcore platforming session following the boss fight that is incredibly difficult to do, and it's like... There's no warning and actually, like, no time. There's maybe two seconds of time after you beat the boss, uh, the, the super boss, before the next section begins. So if you set down your controller or take your guard off for a moment, you lose. You cannot beat the thing, and then you have to go all the way before the boss battle or before the other thing again and again and again, and it's horseshit. 
It's <laughs> it's and I don't know. I feel like it's hard for me to talk about this without sounding like a whiny baby. Like, you know, I beat all the Dark Souls DLC, like whatever, man. It doesn't I don't give a shit. Uh, yeah, who like, you are. But Dark Souls is not a game that sends you all the way back to Firelink Shrine every time you lose to the final boss. Yeah, I don't know, man. It, it's it's like, I, I don't feel like I need to validate myself here. It's It was bad design, and I was fuming when I learned, because I hadn't played the original, when I learned just how much of that stuff was original content. Yeah. Like, it wasn't like the original had, you know... <laughs> Bosses with like 12 to 15 HP with zero visible health bar way to know that you're close to beating them. Uh, you know, I don't know. I could go on forever. Fuck DuckTales. <laughs> That's, it's like, hey, Patrick, how is PAX? DuckTales sucks. Cool. Yeah. See, see you next week. That's the, that's, that's the podcast. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I feel bad. I, I, I've been talking so long. I'm starting to feel guilty about it. No, no, that's, that's part of I, I wanted to hear Sturf and Pax and that, but, but by the way, the streaming truck, let's get that one out of the way. Yeah, okay. Uh, League had a streaming truck in association with Alienware, which, again, active enemies, opponents of Omen by HP, Hewlett Packard's gaming brand, sponsoring such streamers such as Scarzard Plays, Omen by HP. Um, Alienware and Team Liquid had a truck there so you could watch the LCS semifinals all weekend and then they were like hey league let's partner with riot and we'll have a bunch of streamers and and, and creators show up and uh my good friend rin the yordle i believe you know her as well oh yes i don't want to assume but yeah rin is great uh rin if i don't know that she's listening but if she is she's just the fucking best she gave me a red bull randomly we like ran into each other later and someone gave her a giant stack so she gave me a free drink so thank thank you stranger for paying it forward eventually all the way to me <laughs> where whoever you are uh so the first day, Saturday morning, and you know we had to be up at like ten, and we had to be downtown, we had to be at the park. Uh, at ten a.m. Uh, on Saturday was the first ones, and they had a bunch of creative streamers, right? So people who did cosplay, you know, uh, art, things like that. You know, Rin does. You know, let shoutouts to Twitch.tv slash Rin the Yordle. Go fucking watch her stuff. She's amazing. She she plays League, but majority of the time she's doing her art there, and her art is amazing. Um, and it was constantly losing signal. Like, it was really bad. It was clearly not planned. And then, uh, so she told me all of that stuff, and they said they were trying to get uh, get it going. And then it was worse when I showed up. So I showed up, um, you know, like 10.05 or 10.11 because traffic was bad. Um, and I get in, and there's, like, an intern-looking dude for Alienware that's, like, clicking around and and uh and I got to meet with uh, a new writer. She's an ex Twitch employee that now works at Riot and she's very knowledgeable about streaming and I loved her. Uh her name is Sarah Michelle. She kicked ass. She's clearly like the person at Riot that knows the most about streaming. So we were instantly <laughs> like able to meet and connect on that, which is great. Um and you know, I got logged in, I got ready to go, and the moment uh we started streaming we were just dropping frames nonstop. It, it couldn't. Uh, it couldn't sustain a game of league. So I never disconnected from the game itself, but I almost did multiple times. I was lagging a ton. My stream quality was like people. Everyone who was watching and people got up early to watch because this is way earlier than I normally stream uh, to to be there to support me for the thing. It was like every ten seconds the stream would reload and they would see five seconds of me at like a one eighty p quality. And Jesus. before it would stop and they would need to do it again, my stream every 30 seconds went offline. So it was kicking off, you know, auto hosts. It was kicking off all sorts of things. The stats for it were like depressing. Uh, even within the truck, you couldn't, despite it being an open truck, almost like a food truck, the audience couldn't see you and you couldn't see them. They chose to do it like right around the start of the LCS pre-show. So the LCS pre-show is happening and behind the bus where no one is for brief seconds, my stream was available on the truck. The amount of promotion that was happening around the event was pretty poor, which in retrospect, glad, <laughs> right? Yeah. But but still felt pretty embarrassing at the moment to be like, you know, and then on top of that, it's like we were streaming from our own channels and I, and and it's like... I don't I don't know what I would have expected, but it felt weird to be like, hey, show up and do basically an unscheduled stream because that's how streaming works, that everyone is going to show up like, yes, there are big names who people will watch no matter what. But check the difference between like an I'm a cutie pie stream on on an off day versus like an on day. And yeah. you still see 
percentage wise massive massive fluctuations right so it's like do an do like a a sort of scheduled stream that most of your core audience won't be there for we're going to do very little to nothing to ensure that there will be new people there to watch you we're not really going to get people in the audience to understand what's happening or anything about that the equipment is going to be terrible the connection is going to be terrible and so after you know after a 30 minute game of league where i'm also being harassed in game because you know my my internet that is terrible and everything's going out uh they were just like hey this doesn't look like it's going to improve so we're just going to call it and i'm like cool i guess i'm just going to go home and like depression nap forever like i don't know like shit show as a word doesn't seem to describe it the people at alienware didn't seem to have a thought about how this could have even happened yeah you know like like they're like how does how does this work What's going on? And I'm like, yeah, it was. Oh boy, it was got awful. See, children, this is why you only use quality <laughs> products from Oven by HP. <laughs> yeah, that was the people were like, well, if Hewlett Packard had been the one to do this, uh, so you know, we we would have done it. Thanks, Hewlett Packard. I <laughs> we, I mean, you were there on my on the day I we got sponsored. Hewlett, we love to meme on it super hard. It's super funny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. It it was just uh it was super embarrassing. It it feels bad. Uh, Rin was 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 agreeing with me on this. Like when things like this happen, it feels like it's your fault more than it's their fault. Like clearly yeah. I feel bad for them, but it also feels like hey, they're like a multi-million dollar company who's not going to look bad for this whatsoever. Um you're, where, you're the person who's taking the hit, really, because like you, you told your audience, your your people, hey, I'm gonna be doing this thing, and I'm I'm gonna do everything I can to make it good, and then you show up and you give your audience a bad show, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Like, well, there's that's, also that's a really rough thing to do to a content creator. Yeah, but there's also sort of shit where it's like, I don't know, man. Like, 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 God bless that I'm partner too, because if you're if you're not partnered. Um, and you're really grinding to get there. Every single broadcast matters a lot. And there were a lot of affiliates that were there. Some people who luckily had their had their things canceled. I say luckily because um, your average can get bombed by an event like this. Like for instance, it showed it. it Twitch thought that I broadcasted like six different times that day, yeah. and what and the average viewership was spread out across them because. Uh, because people kept disconnecting and reconnecting based on like where they were, where the internet was, where things were happening. And so it's like if I looked at my stats, you would see like a trend. You'd see the normal ups and downs and you just see this fucking wreck. And, it, you know, it's, it's like getting a zero on a test for your score. Right. It's like, yeah, it screws you know, with the metrics and it screws with the algorithms that are yeah. underpinning the systems. And it's exactly the same thing. Like it's the same thing why YouTube is such sometimes such a garbage shit show is that if you upload a video that does poorly, the algorithm says, OK, that's not because it was niche. It doesn't really care about the nuance of was it a niche topic or was it like a uh, just I'm tired. I just want to do something fun for myself kind of thing. It doesn't really care about those things. It just cares. Oh, fewer people were interested in that one. And then it tanks you. And it's the same thing with with Twitch is like. Like, if your metrics go down, then, you know, that's also part of your business as a streamer that gets tanked. And it's yeah. it's really, you, you you really can't do that to a content creator. It's it's unconscionable to a yeah. certain extent. One, one day we'll have to go more in depth about, like, numbers and, like, how just fucking, yeah, uh, they, fucking they will numbers. end you, right? Like, like, you will be absolutely destroyed. Uh, you know, and how many things like Reddit can like totally decide whether or not people like your stuff. There's there's a whole bunch of shit like that that happens. But yeah, in any event, it was like super embarrassing on like every level. You know, it's it's like we try to laugh about it now. But in the moment, I was like, well, I'm very happy that I came out to do this. Uh, yeah. But uh, but other than that, the rest of the event was super cool. Right. Got to see a bunch of friends, got to play a ton of magic, met a bunch of new people doing that. Um. Yeah, so other than that, it was it was pretty fun. Just that little streaming truck incident, kind of dragging it down at the tail end. Yeah. Mm. Ugh, God, I, I, I get secondhand angry just listening to you talk about that, because, like, that's... Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Like, if, if you you go out there and it's like, okay, hey, I have an audience. I, I, I will put my audience in front of your brand so that they can then... And we will collaborate on this thing, and then you get you know kicked in the ass like that that's ooh, ooh, makes my blood boil yeah 
Way to, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to end the, or get close to the end of the podcast, and like, by the way, this shit sucked. <laughs> this yeah. was terrible. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's something that, like, it's it's the kind of, it's the part of the conversation about content creation that, that sometimes I don't think gets heard so much, is that, like, you see a, a big company do, hey, we're doing this event to, to promote the something, something, or whatever. And the per, and the perspective from a lot of people when they see that is, oh, that's nice. The big company is spending some money doing a nice thing for the for the creators. But the thing is, like, it's so easy if that thing is not managed correctly to make it a millstone around the neck of everybody who participates, like to make it a problem for them, to tank them, to 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 cause them cause them damage instead and there's really not a lot of talk about that because anytime a content creator someone like me or you who get to do internet stuff for a living speak up about shit that's bullshit people go oh aren't you being a little bit spoiled like you mr internet man who gets to talk about video games Mm -hmm. for a living aren't you being a little spoiled and it's like yeah this is absolutely privileged but this is also like my rent that's on the line with these things and if you get tanked like that early on in your career Depending on how the algorithm goes, you can get tanked forever. Yeah, if you're unlucky. It, so it's like it's, it's it's yeah. And this is also like a t- this is like a weird time because like my the fourth episode of my show came out and and as of two weeks ago has two point six k views, which is the highest on my channel. And when I came out with one twenty hours ago, and it's like three hundred and fifty, and I'm like, hey, I I don't know if that will get better. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to know if that will get better. You know, there's like. I have almost 2,000 views on the Reddit post that I made. Uh, I, uh, you know, there's so many weird, dark magic things that that uh, can happen that can cause things to rise or fall. That you're just like, well, if I'm, you know, if you're uploading weekly or, or something like that, you're like, well, I just gotta hope it works. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's 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 anxiety inducing, and I think we'll talk about that at some point as well. But yeah. this is a bit about an hour, mostly about packs, which I was very I'm very glad to hear about. I I love hearing stories like that, which is why we did most of the podcast on that. <laughs> if you have any comments, you should feel free to leave them down below. You can ask questions uh, that we might tackle in future episodes of the podcast. Please do go follow uh, Patrick over on his Twitch channel where he streams and he does things uh, to boost his metrics. You know, get that yeah, that hit- engagement going, fam. Smash the like yeah. buttons. Let's uh, let's, let's get that. Should go on. and then and then also if any of you out there like magic you should pressure sky and into learning how to play and building a commander deck so you can be on my uh episode my series that's what i feel bad about i feel like i don't have a i don't have a content thing that i can have you be on but i would i would i would in a heartbeat so yeah clearly i'll, I'll have to i'll have to figure out a, a commander deck for myself yeah then. Have, have the disposable income to build a commander deck i'm kidding we'll <laughs> fake it fucking print it out do sharpies i don't give a shit you'll, you'll be fine We'll, we'll we, figure something out someday. Yeah. Um, Thank you all the, very much for listening, though. To uh, did you have something else? I was just about. No, to, no, 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 no. You're you're good. excellent. All your heart. Uh, so thank thank you very much for listening to the Busy Beards podcast. This is a fun episode for me because I just got to sit and listen most of the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the comments down below, like this, like do all of that stuff. There's links down in the description to the various things that we've been talking about. I encourage you to go and check out this uh, Ring the Yordle, especially who just does fantastic. Yeah. Art and things like that, and we will hopefully be back in two weeks, unless Patrick goes to PAX again, which That's would true. be a yeah. feat uh, that I would be interested to hear about. But <laughs> yeah, also, uh, oh yeah, uh, follow and, and back Boyfriend Dungeon on Kickstarter. Yes, go go play that game. You're gonna love it. I, I guarantee it. Or if you're not gonna love it, I, I don't know how I feel about you as a person. I'm sorry. I'll put that out there. It's a pleasant game made by pleasant people. But I don't mean yeah, to, I like don't mean it to start or a debt to me. Yeah, I don't mean to start a war on your on your channel here, buddy. <laughs> but I just fucking did. I will end Thank you all very much for listening. We'll end the podcast now. Bye bye. Right, yeah. Bye. Goodbye. All right, we did it. We ended the we ended the thing. <laughs>